John, thanks very much for your presentation at the Performance MDT webinar and uh, appreciate your chat. For those of people that didn't actually get to see your presentation, can you just give a brief summary of it, please? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Steve. And uh, thanks again for putting the event on uh, and for, for Playmaker as well and facilitating that. Um, so you kindly asked me to waffle on um, getting the most out of subjective tools in athlete monitoring. Uh, that was the title that I chose because it's an area that I'm passionate about that I feel I've got a lot of value out in recent years. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot of misconceptions around that as well. And those are just some of the things that I kind of wanted to try and, uh, try and address. Um, so I, I sort of frame the talk around where I feel subjective tools sit within the training process, um, which is ultimately giving practitioners an idea of, of tolerance to load to be able to adjust the training plan. Um, then I moved on, started with using Session RPE or the application of RPE within Session RPE um, as a measure of internal load um, and just trying to draw some of the more theoretical concepts behind that into the real world and what it means. Um, so going through um, things like the definition of effort and trying to separate it from other things like fatigue and discomfort, which you can often see. Um, that, that then becomes problematic for what you're trying to measure because if you're not measuring effort, you're not measuring effort. Um, and then moving on to kind of some of the issues with scaling, which I think is probably quite a common one, um, kind of modified scales that, that, that we see, but just to put a bit behind why that's important and, and what difference it makes, um, and then sort of give a bit on um, solutions to kind of kind of get around that, uh, around that and then lent on some of the kind of wider applications in, in differential RPE um, as well. Um, moves on to athlete reported outcome measures of the training response after that. And this is, um, I guess, typically what people might book it as, as wellness, but just coming at it from a, what is it actually? Um, leaning a lot on uh, clinometrics, um, inpatient reported outcome measures, and just stealing some of the, some of the frameworks and methodologies from there to try and really show that we could probably be a bit more better at the way that we define what we want to measure than how we actually measure it. And for me, probably the most important constructs are fatigue, recovery, and soreness. Or, or again, if you go in uh, clinical literature, that would be pain. Um, but trying to just, again, bring it forward in terms of, okay, that's brilliant. That's what, what's in the book. But what, what's that mean in the real world? How do we actually apply and implement it? And then that really bled on to the last part where I, I discussed issues of um, cognitive bias, uh, conscious bias in, in, in cognitive factors and um, situational factors as well. So these are the fact that we're dealing with subjective tools, um, there's a cognitive process and there's the influence of, I guess, non-physiological type factors that we really want to try and get rid of. Um, from a sports science and performance perspective, we really want to hit home on the, on the physical side of things because that's our job. Um, and again, just try to give some practical solutions to real world day to day problems. Um, that was kind of the bits that we aren't as well documented. Um, just just from experience of, of with different teams, athlete types, courts, challenges, um, and trying to again look at how you can potentially overcome them. Um, and that was it from front to back. I've got the first question for you, Sean, that came in uh, during the during your talk, and it was RPE versus differential RPE. Which one do you think is most relevant? Right. Yeah. Cool. So um, I guess just to set the scene, we've got we've got RPE is the perception of effort at any given point in time during exercise, um, theoretically used as an indicator of internal exercise intensity. Session RPE is the application of that, whereby it's the average RPE for the session. Um, and then we multiply that by training duration to give a, a load metric. And I, I like to use the area under the curve type analogy for that. Uh, differential RPE, so this is again, going back to just RPE as a measure of intensity at any point in time. The whole idea behind differential RPE is to separate that global perception of effort into its two primary mediators. What we think are probably the two primary mediators in healthy individuals, and that is, kind of exertion from the central system. So this might be respiratory, breathlessness, uh, and peripheral um, leg muscles. Um, again, that, that's sort of the theory behind it. And I think it was, it was really well articulated by um, the guys from John Moore's, uh, the group from over in, in, in Belgium as well, 
um, looking at the potential to separate physiological and biomechanical load. Um, now, it's not quite as clear cut as that because if you think about peripheral exertion, it can be physiological and biomechanical. Uh, but the idea is it's just really about trying to separate out those two constructs because when it comes to athlete management, they have very different um, adaptation pathways. They have very different recovery times to baseline from a session. Um, and that all that influences entirely the way that you structure your training, your recovery, um, and again, the way that you that you manage athletes overall. So uh, the thing that I toyed around with for, for years in terms of uh, my own demons with it is, is it, do you use global RPE? Do you use this, what they call a gestalt measure? It's perceived to be more than the sum of its individual parts. Um, or, or do you try and be a bit more specific and, and, and split it down? Now, these evidence to say that um, when you do, split and use differential RPE, that, the, that there's good face and convergent validity in terms of we th what we think we're measuring, we probably are. Um, but then I think there's also, I guess the danger of doing that is that you, you start to handle more and more data and it's how does it then fit within the whole system. Um, for example, one thing I'm not convinced on at the moment is the application of differential RPE as a load measure. So this would be um, instead of RPE times time, reference as RPE times time or leg RPE times time. Now, of course you can do that, but your times in both of them, both of those outcome measures by time. So they're going to, they're going to correlate pretty well, to be honest, because time is a constant factor. So then how much novel or new information um, is it, is it giving you? I guess the question that you need to ask yourself is would, would, would my athletes in the way that they're managed and our performance setup and system benefit from having this additional information that we could potentially use to monitor, evaluate, and program training. Um, and, and that additional information comes at, as it's kind of what's the cost of that? Well, it, it's asking the athletes some additional questions. Um, and again, I've gone back and forward between collecting global and differential together, just global, just differential. The bottom line is if I've got a group of athletes who've never used RPE before, I'm probably going to start with global just to get the head around that. And as part of that education process, it's help, It's making them understand that to appraise that perception, it mainly depends on feelings of breathlessness or, or strain within the leg muscles. And then the natural separation between the two. Athletes, tend it tends to be pretty innate and obvious when you ask them about those two. If you're then getting, um, if you're then getting the impression that there's potentially that they have their own confusions in separating those two in terms of they, 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 they can, and they see that it's quite a big difference sometimes. So people might say, Oh, my overall RP, well, my legs felt fine. Um, but I was, you know, I was blowing. I was really, you know, that was like, yeah, I'm like very hard. I'm a seven out of 10. So they've effectively made the decision based purely on the physiological load. Um, perhaps negating the fact that there was quite a relatively low biomechanical load. So that would be a situation where you would see that as a practitioner and go, I might have value in, in separating this and, and splitting the score up there. Um, so yeah, it comes back down to, I, I don't think, I think if you collect an RPE from a resource point of view, um, it's probably, there's probably no limitations there. For me, the question has to come more um, conceptually. Do you believe that it's going to give you additional information that is worthwhile to the process? And I was fortunate for my PhD um, Viva to be examined by Barry Drust and Greg Atkinson. And, and Barry was very clear at the beginning when I used this phrase in terms of, is it worthwhile or not? He, and he kind of, he challenged me on what does it mean? What, what does worthwhile mean? Like what's the operational definition of that? And, and I've always then ran with something being worthwhile to the training process as anything where the benefit of the information to potentially improve monitoring, prescription, planning, programming, and athlete management outweighs the cost of being able to collect, process, analyze, and turn around the data. So for me, it probably is a worthwhile exercise. There's definitely more that can be done to understand the best uh, implemented, how it can be best implemented and utilized. Um, but yeah, in terms of splitting the two up, I do honestly feel that you get that a little bit more richer information from, from differential RPE. Athletes seem to get it. And if you look at this framework of trying to separate physiological and biomechanical internal load, it can lend and just help out a little bit there. It's been useful um, from like a proxy point of view. Cheers, Sean. And, um, and like with 
most of the questions got that got asked during the uh, webinar, you actually answered the next question within your previous question answer even. So uh, yeah, yeah, I've done myself out of a job. <laughs> very, very, no, very detailed. Like, just very briefly, have you found that if there was like any modalities of exercises that you'd see bigger differences between? Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, bottom line on this one, um, quite clearly and obvious in resistance training, it, it's very much more peripheral. So RPEs for upper and lower body are greater than breathlessness. Uh, and that's a bit of phase validity proof of concept. That does differ depending on the type of resistance training because breathlessness, uh, we have seen increases when the stimulus becomes more metabolic. Um, we, we've, we've uh, John O'Weekly and I have looked at... Um, some, some RPE data from different velocity loss protocols during the back squat um, where Jono had the players squatting up until a 10% velocity loss, a 20% and a 30%. And when it gets more and more um, metabolically demanding, so when the repetitions are going higher naturally because you're working until a greater velocity loss, um, you do see that kind of spike in the in almost the met well, the theoretically and conceptually the metabolic response and we think that that's probably picked up in the respiratory compensation that you get from that um on the pitch to be honest with you it's it's real minefield and i've sort of went to back and forward with this one again so within within pure team sport technical tactical training sometimes you often see um minimal or non-meaningful differences between the two scores so you might get in in, in football and soccer players will tell you that it was hard it was hard to breathe and it felt hard on the legs. So there's no difference between the two. If you're seeing that consistently, and that's the main thing you're trying to implement it to, uh, to get information from, then that's when you ask the question, is it worth me asking these two separate scores? Um, potentially what you're looking for then is the time when the, the one off time, maybe one out of 10 where there is a difference. And then that's kind of your flag within your monitoring system to say, hold on kind of legs as a function of breathlessness we sort of expected them to be about the same but we've we've seen a, a discoupling between the two there um matt wright uh, from teesside university he's begun to to look at some of that stuff in in youth girls soccer um he's got a paper coming out uh, in igspp pretty soon and again that's trying to lean on the fact that yes the two are probably related but during exercise the central and peripheral systems are related so there would be you would expect that response um, and what's actually maybe a useful monitoring to, tool then is the discoupling between the two scores. Um, high intensity interval training, again, that's where you, again, you, you see subtle differences and it tends to be breathlessness uh, slightly higher than legs. We've done a bit of work with that uh, through Johnny Taylor, Tom McPherson, Matt Weston, uh, and the group up in Scotland as well with, with Neil Gibson and Gary McEwen. Um, so it, it's a typical response that during running based hit uh, in team sport athletes, at least, and recreational you tend to find that, that heightened breathlessness response as opposed to, to peripheral. Um, and that can be a bit of a contrast because you look at something like repeated sprint training, it's typically thought of as quite neuromuscular and peripheral demanding. Now, of course it is, um, but it is superseded by that, by that respiratory response. So yeah, just trying to tease out where the differences exist and why is, is probably what we've spent a lot of time in trying to understand because then that comes back to then, okay, how do you understand it? Because to understand it is to then have the ability to make a decision on it. And, and again, that decision comes back to athlete management from a training recovery point of view. So number three coming your way, Sean, and I'll, 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 uh, I'll read it straight from how it was written. So for something that we thought was so simple yet so complicated, as you say, does it give us the, does it give us the value of monitoring train loads in comparison to other measures such as GPS and heart rate, which was a topic of conversation this weekend? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I mean, I'll, I'll probably answer that in two. So the first part in terms of, if, if I get the, the first part there is we thought it was simple, but it might not be. And the second part, does it give us value of comparing object, the objective with the subjective? If I've interpreted that right. Um, yeah, the first part, um, this, this is a real, um, Robin Thorpe and I had a conversation about this um, last week just after the webinar and it, it's a typical response. It's, oh, we, we, do, we use RPE or we use subjectives because they're easy, because they're feasible. Um, and actually, when you, when you kind of break it down, the, for me, they're not. They're very difficult and they're very complex. They're complex in terms of what's underneath them, the theory 
uh, behind them, the complex in terms of the, 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 um, the constructs that we're trying to measure. On face value, it looks simple because you ask somebody a question, you get a response. Now, don't get me wrong, it should be simple. But there are potentially so many things that can influence immediately that response that you need to control for. Switching on a GPS is, is simple. And just before I get on this, I'm not bashing GPS or external load monitoring. Switching on a GPS is simple. It's reliable in the sense that it should happen every time. And there is very few things that could happen that would reduce your ability to switch that GPS on. Asking somebody how hard they thought a session was relies on a multitude of things. It relies on, do they understand what you mean by how hard was the session? Can they accurately retrieve the information to answer that question? Can they give you the, an accurate response in terms of, okay, now I know what the answer is in my head. How do you want me to respond? And in terms of RPE, we want them to respond by a scale. The words are for them, the numbers are for us. We're trying to assign quantifiable rating to the perception itself. And of course, there's error in that process. Um, first of all, does the athlete understand how to use the scale? Secondly, what scale are we implementing? Because if you have an RPE scale that says hard is eight from 10, and the athlete says, yeah, it was hard, that means it was an eight. The athlete's got the right perception. There's been the wrong quantifiable number assigned to it. Um, and again, there's, there's the psychometric theory that for over 50, 60 years, the, the back's let up. Then you've got this, this potential influence of, of social bias. And we've all seen it, and hopefully everyone can relate to this in terms of you're, you're asking people RPE and people are just shouting out numbers to you. And you've got John in the corner who thought it was very hard. So he knows he's going to give you a seven. But when Dick, Tom and Harry give a 4.5, there's no chance he's giving you a seven anymore. There's no chance because... And again, it comes back to that competitive nature of us as humans and also of athletes as well. They instinctively think that that is going to be flagged up as something that need, that warrants a conversation or consideration in something. It depends how it's used in the system or it depends how the athletes perceive it to be used in the system. And this is another thing in terms of trying to increase the overall motivation to, uh, to have athletes buy in and respond accurately to make sure that they... Uh, trust in that we're using this for a genuine reason um, to try and help us do the best job that we can to help make them do the best job that they can. It's about them and the coaches. We're just here to support, in, in my opinion, and, and, and lead in on professional opinion and expert domain knowledge as and when we can, again, mainly from from a physical point of view, if you look at sort of managing the training process. So, yeah, that's when, when people say, oh, it's simple and it's easy. I'm like, Pfft. I'm glad you've nailed it because I've been trying for eight years and I haven't yet. So I've got a bit of catching up to do. Um, again, look back, turn that back to an objective system, which has different benefits and different challenges, but the technology, the implementation, the acquisition of data um, should be far less or far more, sorry, valid and reliable from the point of view of repeatability of the equipment, things like that. Um, in terms of collecting things, objective alongside subjective absolutely i mean for me you know one of the real powerful things you can do with with rpe uh, um as an internal load measure is to look at its its um changes and trends in response to external load because this is this is the dose response theory of training external is the means by in which internal is induced um so we're simply looking at looking at the relationship there and if we know that something like total distance uh, correlates well with session RPE training load, which it does out of all the external metrics, it appears that total distance is probably the, the greatest one, whether theoretically that marries up, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. And there's, there's a, a debate there for sure. But if you know that the two relate, I mean, for me, first of all, the question was, why am I collecting both? Then? Why don't I just collect one? But you're looking for the times when that relationship is broken when there's a data point that comes in that falls outside where you would expect it to be. And that's your flag. That's your flag for action. And for me, their action is spending the time or investing the time to dig into other data or just bypassing that phase and going to speak to the athlete or the coach about something. Um, so definitely the relationship between variables, massively important. And if we can conceptually agree that, uh, or, or at least accept that these things that we measure are probably all different, even though they are, they're all in, interrelated. Heart rate, RPE, external load, it's how they fit together as a holistic system. Um, and again, you're looking for kind of these non-obvious deviations, you're looking for changes and trends and patterns that 
you wouldn't expect things that make you look at your report twice and go, oh, that, that shouldn't be there. That's a bit of a, a naughty data point. Why is that floating all the way up there? If you can then lean on the fact and be confident that you have collected things in the most robust and rigorous way that you can trust the data that's there, that's the thing that starts the conversation or starts the next sequence of actions that you do to ultimately action that. And it might just be that it's a, a red herring. It might be that something else flags up that you implement something additional. Um, and then it does result in, in some kind of action in and around the, the, the training process. And, and just imagining now you sat in front of your laptop like going, oh, you naughty data point and stuff like that after that. <laughs> as, as I do every day. He yeah, does yeah. it. Oh, you naughty happened. data point. Sad. <laughs> you know me, Steve. I don't quite say it as um, politically correct as that. <laughs> but I'm minding my P's and Q's because Rob's got a microphone. Everyone's been professional. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, last, last question. <clears throat> and I'm going to restrict you to naming it. And then saying why within one or two sentences. Okay. If, if you had to choose one method of monitoring training and match load, no restrictions, what would it be and why? Uh, is this kind of everything included? One method. One method. For me, for training and match load, again, being completely honest, and I'm, I'm sticking my neck on the block with this, but I would go back to, to session RPE. And I would, the reason I would do that is because I believe that the information is there to make it work, to make it work right. Um, I believe that it allows us to talk across different types of training and make those comparisons. And it goes back to Occam's razor, you know, and, and it goes back to training theory. Internal load is what we want to be measuring. For me, after that, external load is, is, is the thing that we would look to try and explain it. But um, if, we're, if we're prescribing and describing training and constructing the program such that we can that we can infer on the external load that we know that we we program more sets and reps this week we we program longer training sessions we use a, a larger sided game so we expect greater distances acceleration efforts whatever it's that internal response that we don't know that we're trying to to manage um so yeah there's uh there's my honest and probably unpopular opinion here's sean appreciate that and thank you again for your time um, if anyone's got any further questions for you, where can they reach you? Uh, the best place is, is probably my Twitter. Um, I've, I had a few people get in touch after last week, which was, uh, which was, which was really warm. Um, my Twitter handle is at Sean underscore McLaren one. Um, that's the correct spelling of Sean, which is S H A U N. Um, and then, yeah, that's probably the best, uh, the best for me. Cheers, Sean. Thank you. For Thanks fellas. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Mate. Take care.